Good evening, and welcome to our fifth session of our Holy Week retreat. Uh, tonight we will talk about the fifth sorrow, the crucifixion and death of Jesus. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Mary, you brighten our path as a sign of salvation and of hope. We entrust ourselves to you, health of the sick, who at the cross took part in Jesus' pain while remaining steadfast in faith. O loving Mother, you know what we need, and we are confident that you will provide for us as at Cana in Galilee. Intercede for us with your Son, Jesus, the Divine Physician, for those who have fallen ill, for those who are vulnerable, and for those who have died. Intercede also for those charged with protecting the health and safety of others, and for those who are tending to the sick and seeking a cure. Help us, O Mother of Divine Love, to conform to the will of the Father and to do as we are told by Jesus, who took upon himself our sufferings and carried our sorrows, so as to lead us through the cross to the glory of the resurrection. Amen. Under thy protection, we seek refuge, O Holy Mother of God. In our needs, despise not our petitions, but deliver us always from all dangers, O glorious and blessed Virgin. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So we see in this uh, gospel passage, which is um, from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 30, we see in this gospel passage that our Blessed Lady is present at the foot of the cross at the moment that Jesus gives up his spirit. So there is such a thing uh, called a dry martyrdom, you know, as opposed to a bloody martyrdom. Um, you know, we usually think of martyrdom in terms of the shedding of blood. Uh, we think of all of those great missionaries and saints in the history of the church uh, who went to preach the gospel only to encounter um, opposition, physical opposition, um, and even um, were killed for preaching the gospel. Um, that's usually what we think of when we when we use that word martyrdom. You know, that's why on feast days of, of martyrs, we wear the color red at Mass, a red for blood. Well, there are some who suffer martyrdom, um, the giving up, the sacrifice of their life for Christ without the shedding of blood. Um, these are the saints who suffer tremendously without being put to death. Um, they suffer tremendously for Christ, um, but they're not put to death. So uh, oftentimes tradition refers to them as dry martyrs. Um, and certainly Mary suffered a dry martyrdom. Um, Mary herself was not crucified. Um, but she certainly suffers so tremendously having to see the suffering of her son. 
We've already said how the saints call her suffering greater than any martyr's suffering. Um, She knows that she is called to be there alongside our Lord through his passion. She has known that since the moment Simeon told her that a sword would pierce her heart, that she would share in Christ's sufferings. Uh, St. John, in this gospel passage that I just read, um, that first line, um, standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother. That line really says everything about her martyrdom. He says, uh, behold her at the foot of the cross, looking at her dying son, and then see if there is grief like her grief. Of course, we know that there is no grief like Mary's grief, no grief on that same level, uh, because no one loved at the the level that Mary loved. Uh, After the soldiers crucified our Lord, they left him there to die. But Mary does not leave. She remains. Uh, Sorrow, grief, fear, horror, um, any or all of those things might have compelled anyone to run away. Uh, But Mary does not abandon him. Uh, She can't abandon him. Her love for him won't let her leave his pierced side. Um, But instead, she draws nearer. She must share in his sufferings. She must draw near. Love attracts her to Jesus. Love compels her to draw nearer. She stays because she is his mother. She stays because she is his perfect disciple. You know, when we consider how Mary loved her son, um, we can say that there are uh, three ways in particular that Mary loved her son. Number one, she loved Jesus with a natural, instinctive love that a mother has for a son. Uh, He was her son, and she loved him as his mother. Um, She also loved him with a natural love that one has for someone that we know is good, who treats us well, right? Uh, We have that experience. You know, we, there is a certain, um, uh, you know, attraction towards someone who who really is, is very kind to us. Well, Jesus, of course, was the greatest of all sons, uh, who certainly loved Mary as his mother. Uh, You know that he treated her well. You know that he respected her. You know that he honored her. And Mary certainly loved him for that. But then she also loved him as God. Uh, She knew that he was God and loved him with an immaculate heart. You know, our love is imperfect. Why? Because of our sinfulness. But Mary was not tainted by sin at any point in her life. Uh, So her love was always perfect. And again, she had perfect fidelity. Her love was characterized by her perfect fidelity. She stayed when everyone else left. Again, she is always there with Jesus. Now, Mary, of course, doesn't concern herself with her own suffering, which is terrible indeed. Uh, Her heart is only concerned with the suffering and death of her son. Not even death could separate her from him. And that's the difference that love of Christ makes, right? We are not separated from him in life or in death. And even though he has died, she cannot leave. But it is that love for Christ that magnifies her own pain. Uh, Mary suffered all of these pains uh, of Jesus. Uh, She knew that she would, and and she certainly, uh, especially here at the foot of the cross, uh, every every nail, every uh, scourge at the pillar, uh, the crown of thorns, every wound, Mary suffers that in her own heart. Uh, St. Jerome said, Every torture inflicted on the body of Jesus was a wound in the heart of the mother. St. John Chrysostom said that on Calvary, there were two altars on which two great sacrifices were consummated, one in the body of Jesus, the other in the heart of Mary. Although uh, um, St. Bonaventure says that it's really only one altar, the altar of the cross, and on it hung the Savior of the world, but also Mary, who nailed herself 
to that same cross. Uh, St. Augustine also says um, along the lines of the same thing, the cross and nails of the Son were also the cross and nails of the Mother. Christ being crucified, the Mother was also crucified. Uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, Love inflicted on the heart of Mary the same suffering that the nails caused in the body of Jesus. And then finally, St. Bernardine of Siena, at the same time that the son was sacrificing his body, the mother was sacrificing her soul. So, as we've said many times, Mary truly shared in Christ's sufferings. She suffered. When, when we say that Mary suffered, she suffered. And that's why, you know, compared to all the other martyrs throughout the church's history, Mary's martyrdom, her dry martyrdom, was crueler than any other martyrdom because no one ever loved as she loved. No mere creature has ever suffered so much. But the magnitude of Mary's sufferings is measured not only in their intensity, because Mary suffered intensely, um, but we also me measure Our Lady's sufferings uh, in terms of their length of time how elongated Mary's sufferings were. Hers was the longest of sufferings, because for Mary, it began at the first sorrow 33 years earlier. From that moment that Simeon spoke those words to Mary, that a sword would pierce her heart, she has had to reflect on those words interiorly and accept them. And so those words that she carried um, from that first moment when she and Joseph presented the child Jesus in the temple, from that moment she has had, she has had to carry that suffering, that burden within her heart. And accept it, she did. Um, but not only accept, she offered her sufferings along with that of her son. This, again, is why in our tradition, we often refer to Mary as co-redeemer. Now, again, sometimes people have a problem with us as Catholics using that title of Mary, co-redeemer. Um, you know, of course, Christ alone is the redeemer. Um, he alone is the savior. And it is his suffering, his death alone, that was the redemption of mankind. Um, you know, we, we don't dispute that, of course. That's what we believe. But Mary shared in that suffering in such a perfect manner and offered that suffering to the Father that we can say that she fully cooperated with Christ in bringing us forth to the life of grace. Uh, it was the will of God that she cooperate in Christ's work of redemption. Mary cooperated with our Lord in his passion. And it is her cooperation that God used um, and, and to help bring about the conversion of sinners. And it's a reminder to, to all of us, to you and to me, that we are called, like Mary, to cooperate in Christ's saving work. You and I are called to cooperate in Christ's passion, in his work of redemption. You and I are called to be dry martyrs. Um, yes, you and I are called to martyrdom. Um, not necessarily a bloody martyrdom, please God, no, but at least a dry martyrdom. Um, so how does that come about? How do we do that? How do we live this dry martyrdom in our life? Well, we do this when, like Mary, we too offer our sufferings, our crosses, our inconveniences to the Father. We do that when we unite them to our Lord's sufferings on the cross for the salvation of souls. You know, there's a, there's a point in the Mass where, um, where the priest offers the bread and the wine um, to the Father, right? Um, uh, the gifts of bread and wine are offered by the priest to the Father. And uh, spiritually, for us, when we attend Mass, um, one thing that we can do at that moment 
is we place ourselves, our sufferings, along with that offering. You know, we can offer our sufferings to the Lord um, because that is what we are called to do. You know, Mother Angelica said that while everyone suffers, um, suffering itself does not make us holy. Uh, rather, suffering is wasted when it is not united with love to Christ's passion. But when we unite our sufferings to Christ's passion, he takes them and makes them spiritually fruitful for souls. Um, you know, your soul, my soul, the souls of the whole world. And this is what can give us consolation in our own sorrows, that when I offer my sorrows, my sufferings, my burdens, my hardships, my trials, when I offer all of these things to the Lord, I know that they are not wasted because I know that he will take them and they will bring souls to salvation. Uh, perhaps my own, perhaps the souls of my family, especially those who have fallen away. You know, we think of the tears of, of St. Monica that brought St. Augustine back to the faith. It was her suffering, her tears that were not um, ignored by the Lord. Uh, the Lord knew that St. Monica suffered greatly for her son and her husband. And, and so the Lord, the Lord considered those tears and, and because they were offered to him by St. Monica out of love, um, God made them fruitful and brought about the conversion of her husband and St. Augustine. And how many souls were saved and continue to be saved because of the sufferings that Mary was willing to take on out of obedience to God. God used those sufferings offered with love by Mary and made them fruitful. Jesus himself revealed to St. Bridget, My mother Mary, on account of her compassion and charity, was made mother of all in heaven and on earth. Uh, many souls were reborn in grace because of Mary's sufferings, which God used uh, for their conversion. <clears throat> so that can give us some consolation in our own sufferings, um, knowing that um, Mary shows us that God will use our sufferings for good if we offer them to him. But what can also give us consolation in our own sufferings is that we have such a wonderful mother in Mary. You know, from the cross, as we heard in the gospel at the beginning of this talk, from the cross, Jesus looks to John, who stands in place of all of us. Um, and he says to him, behold your mother. And then and she, he also turns to Mary and says, behold your son. And, and in doing this, Jesus from the cross gives Mary to us to be our spiritual mother. And like a good mother, she always consoles her children. Uh, moreover, she knows what it is to suffer. Uh, by standing at the cross in her desolation, she merited the ability to console anyone, to console you, to console me in our sufferings. Mary sees Jesus in each one of her children. That's what it means to be her children. Um, she sees she sees Jesus in each one of us. And so when we suffer, Mary will always be there with us, just as she always remained with Jesus. Mary, unlike everyone else, did not abandon Jesus at the cross. Mary will not abandon us in our suffering as well. And that's why we should always be mindful of, of turning to Mary in our in our sufferings, in those low points in our life when we feel desolate or anxious or fearful or worried uh, or burdened or overwhelmed, uh, whatever it might be, uh, we must always remember that Mary has not left us. She is there waiting to console us. Lastly, um, Mary also teaches us about perfect modesty. Mary is uh, the great teacher of virtues. And um, from the foot of the cross, 
Mary teach us, teaches us all about the virtuous life. Um, she, teaches, uh, she teaches us about perfect modesty. Now, modesty, usually when we use that word, we think of attire, we think of clothing, we think of what we wear. Um, you know, that's, that's a part of it, of course. Uh, we have to be modest in our dress, in our attire. But modesty as a virtue really has to do with how we carry our whole selves. Remember, virtue is not only about the soul, it's also about the body. We talked about that in the very first talk on on Sunday night. Um, There was modesty in Mary's demeanor. You know, think about the the grief, um, the, uh, the anguish that Mary must have been standing there at the foot of the cross. Um, one would understand if Mary, in her, in her humanity, was uncontrollably emotional at the foot of the cross, inconsolable. We would understand that. Uh, but Scripture doesn't portray her that way. Now, some would look at that as unfeeling or, or cold, uh, but Mary is the complete opposite of that. Remember, Mary suffered um, a suffering greater than, than any of us. Um, so she was suffering. <clears throat> but what, this, what it says is that despite her suffering, despite the intensity and the magnitude of her suffering, she was completely in control of herself. That's what virtue does. Virtue gives us the spiritual strength that we need for self-control. This is why, you know, when we're struggling with our passions, um, maybe we're struggling with lust, or we're struggling with anger, or we're struggling with our appetites for food or for drink. Um, You know, we're all wired with passions. That's part of being human. The passions are good. Um, We're not robots. You know, uh, the passions are good. That's where we're wired and created with passions. But sometimes uh, those passions can become inflamed. And if we don't know how to control them, they become, they get out of control. And that's when we oftentimes get in trouble. Um, When we're struggling with our passions, uh, it's important to know how to cultivate virtue in order to combat those Um, out-of-control passions. Uh, Yes, we need to pray, of course. Everything starts with prayer. But we also need to cultivate virtue. And Mary, in her perfect virtue, um, her demeanor, her modesty at the foot of the cross shows us uh, what a virtuous life she had, that she was completely in control. Uh, She also teaches us humility. She knew that she must stay there with Christ. This is what God asked of her. This was her cross to carry, and no one could carry it for her. This was her cross to carry. And out of her humility, she carried it, she accepted it as from God. So it is there, um, you know, the the, the point of, of, of saying these things is that it is there at the foot of the cross this is where all of the virtues really, um, Mary lived a virtuous life her whole life. Everything about Mary was full of virtue, but it is especially there at the foot of the cross where all of her virtues really shined forth. Her faith, her hope, uh, her charity, uh, her prudence, her fortitude, her temperance, her humility, her justice, her modesty, her docility to God's will. Everything um, was really on full display there at the foot of the cross um, because the virtues, her perfect, um, her perfection of virtue allowed her to stand there. That's why this moment, this fifth sorrow, um, her standing there at the foot of the cross, this was her most glorious moment. Um, This was the moment where she shows her excellence in virtue. Again, she lived a virtuous life her whole life. Everything that she did was full of virtue. But here at the foot of the cross, um, where where the magnitude of everything was, was so intense, this is where 
she shows her excellence and virtue. This is the chief moment in her life where we point to her and say, this is the strongest woman the world has ever known. Now for us, this is our most glorious moment as well, when we stand at the foot of the cross. Um, you and I, of course, always have to deal with the cross in our own life. Again, how do we deal with our crosses? Um, <clears throat> hopefully, you know, those are the moments when our virtue shines forth, uh, when we are challenged, when we are overwhelmed, when we are burdened, when we are suffering. Um, you know, every cross is an opportunity to show strength and virtue. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, we fall short. Sometimes uh, we don't handle our crosses as well as we should. Uh, sometimes we, we run away. Um, this crisis that we are going through right now is also an opportunity to show strength and virtue. Um, how do we handle the crosses that God allows us to take? And again, hopefully we spend our life cultivating virtue, practicing virtue, so when these moments come in our life, uh, that's when our virtue, our strength, our spiritual strength can really shine forth. This is why um, the Catholic life uh, should always be a virtuous life. You know, this is why as Catholics, we should always be practicing and working on the virtues um, because those need to be strong in those moments when we really need them. Um, so how did Mary do it? Um, how did Mary stand there with Christ at the foot of the cross? Um, hopefully in these meditations we, we get a sense of how, how intense, how agonizing, how, um, how powerful these sorrows were for Mary. Uh, like I said at the beginning, the, the seven sorrows aren't just a list of things that made Mary sad. These are things that Mary really suffered, and it, it's hard to, um, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to underestimate how intense these sorrows were for Mary. Um, Mary suffered, and yet as we watch her and as we reflect on her, you know, it's, we, it's important that we think about how did Mary handle these sorrows? How did Mary stay strong? How did Mary, um, uh, how did her virtues shine forth in these moments? And then how can I imitate that in my own life? What do I need to do um, so that I can, um, so that I can handle my crosses in the same way that Mary handled hers? How did Mary stand there with Christ at the foot of the cross? These would be good things for us to think about as we continue our retreat. So may Our Lady bless us and obtain for us a share in her virtues. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.